Well, there are other things going on too, because there's twister theory. Now you see, that's I don't usually talk about it in interviews because it's a bit hard to explain. But that's an idea which I had a lot of people working on when I was in my uh, graduate students. I had a lot of graduate students, and many of them worked on twister theory, which gives a different different point of view of how to do, view physics, if you like. See, usually we think of space-time, and space is three dimensions, and then time is another one. So you've got the space-time, which is a four-dimensional structure. And the basic thing it's made of are these little points. We call them events, you see. No, no dimension in space, no dimension in time. They blip, you see, like that. Those are the points in space-time or the events. Now, you see, in twister theory, that's not the basic structure. The basic thing is basically well, it's something like a photon. It's, it goes along with the speed of light, and you can identify the points because you have a family of them going through that point. It's, sort of t it t it's a kind of geometry which turns the ordinary way of looking at physics inside out. Some things are more difficult to do, some things are a lot easier to do. And what's a lot easier is to describe fields like the Maxwell field for radiation, the gravitational field. In fact, gravitational field... Well, there's a story here, you see. Photons can spin left-handed or right-handed. And you can describe the wave function of a left-handed one or a right-handed one. And usually you add them together because they both spins combine together to give you the linear polarizations, the things that in your polarized glasses you have. They let the light through one way and not the other way. And these add, you add two right-handed and left-handed together to get the linear polarized. Then there are different ways of doing it. Anyway, that's the way photons work. Now we see in twister theory, it's very peculiar. You have a, two different formulae, one which works for the right-handed and one which works for the left-handed. And for the gravitons, that is the particle of gravity, if you like, again, you do this. But you see, with gravity, <coughs> you want to make it fit in with Einstein's theory so it changes space. Space-time is changed by the gravity. And then you find you can do it, and you can do it for the left-handed ones, but not for the right-handed ones. And this was a great puzzle to me because well, twister theory has got a twist to it, so it's left and right are not quite the same in the theory. And you could do the left-handed ones and not the right-handed ones. And I used to call this the googly problem because in cricket, you see, you ball a cricket ball, and if it spins, what's a thing called a leg break? And if it spins left-handed, that's a leg break. And if you're very clever, not many people can do it, you can make it spin looking as though it's got left-handed, but actually spins right-handed. And that's what's called a googly. So we call this the googly problem, because you're trying to get the right-handed graviton in the framework which does the left-handed one. And that was a stumbling block which took about 40 years. <laughs> and only fairly recently, I had an idea with some help from Michael Atia, who I've got ideas from quite often. And uh, I had sort of part of the idea, and I didn't quite understand the other part, which he explained. And. Uh, even then, it took another five years to make it work. But I think it works. So this is a way of describing physics in this unusual way. And, and if you can spin both the right and the left, you can do also the, <coughs> the particle interactions, the, the strong interactions and the weak interactions, and you can put the right and the left together. And I, I haven't done any of this, but it's a potential way of looking at physics in a completely different way. Well, some of it's been looked at already. People have, people have picked up on twister theory, but not on this latest idea. They use it for scattering problems, for massless particles and things, but not to the extent that this would be a, a global theory which you'd be able to translate physics into this other language. And it has sort of features which I, appeal to me very much. One of them is the use of complex numbers. You see, usually people think of numbers or the integers, one, two, three, four, or fractions, which are seven over five or whatever it is, or real numbers, which you write by decimal, which goes off to infinity, really. So you t tend to think of physics in terms of real numbers. They're called real numbers. They're not real in the ordinary sense of real, but well, they're real, but they're no more real than some other kinds of numbers. But the things called imaginary numbers or complex numbers are things where you're allowed to take the square root of minus one. And that's the key thing. You're allowed to have a thing you call i, and that's the square root of minus 1. Once you put that into it, you have a whole new 
but not that new. It was <laughs> many centuries ago when the idea was introduced. But it's a whole different way of looking at the world. And the thing about it is quantum mechanics already looks at the world that way. Quantum mechanics, the states in quantum mechanics, involve these complex numbers. So the idea is that you bring that kind of complex number geometry into the real world and the classical world and it's somehow the quantum and classical get all mixed up and it's a different way of looking at things and there's very beautiful mathematics in the complex world if you like which you don't see in the real world and it's and it's uh, something which when I was an undergrad a mathematics undergraduate I was absolutely stunned by the magic that there is in these complex complex number means it's got a real number and imaginary number together in the same number. And the algebra and the analysis and all that stuff and the geometry of these numbers has an elegance which you don't see in the real number geometry. So it always struck me as, you know, wouldn't it be nice if somehow that was what governed the world? And that's what Twister Theory does. It gives you a complex number picture, real and imaginary together picture of the world which involves quantum ideas as well as classical ones. But the new idea where the googly problem seems to be solved, I haven't had a chance to, to look at it very seriously. And maybe well, can, what are spinners? Let's start with spinner because I, th I think that if we can introduce that then I can By the way, say, twister is spelled with an O <laughs> and spinner is spelled with an O as well. Yes. Okay. So in case you want to Google it and look it up, there's very nice Wikipedia pages as a starting point. I don't know what is a good starting point for Twister 3. <laughs> uh, well, one thing you say about Penrose, I mean, Penrose is actually a very good writer and also a very good draftsman. He's on drafts. He, he, to the extent this is visualizable, he actually has done some very nice drawings. So, I mean, almost any kind of expository thing you can find him writing is is a very good a good place to start. He's a, he's a remarkable person. But the, um, so... Spinners are something that independently came out of mathematics and out of physics. And um, to say where they came out of physics, I, I mean, what people realized when they started looking at elementary particles like electrons or whatever, that there there seemed to be there seemed to be some kind of doubling of the degrees of freedom going on. If you counted what was there in some sense in the way you would expect it, and when you started doing quantum mechanics and started looking at elementary particles, there were seemed to be two degrees of freedom. There, not one. And one way of seeing it was that if you um, if you put your electron in a strong magnetic field and ask and ask what was the energy of it, instead of it having one energy, it would have two energies. There'd be two energy levels, and, and as you increase magnetic field, the splitting would increase. So physicists kind of realized that. Wait a minute. So in, we thought when we were doing first started doing quantum mechanics that the way to describe particles was in terms of wave functions, and these wave functions were complex to complex values. Well, if we actually look at particles, that that's not right. They're, they're, they're pairs of complex numbers. They're pairs of complex numbers. So, you know, why, so one of the kind of fundamental, from the physics point of view, the fundamental question is, why are all our kind of fundamental particles described by pairs of complex numbers? Just weird. And then, but if you go, and then, then you can ask, you know, well, what happens if you like take an electron and rotate it? So how, how do things move in this this pair of complex numbers? Well, now if you go back to mathematics, what had been been understood in mathematics, you know, some years earlier, not that many years earlier, was that if you um, if you ask very very generally, think about geometry of three dimensions, and ask, and if you think about things that are happening in three dimensions, in the standard way, everything, the standard way of doing geometry, everything is about vectors, right? So if you've if you take it any mathematics classes, you probably see vectors at some point. They're just triplets of numbers tell you what a direction is or how how far you're going in three dimensional space. And most of a, everything we teach in most standard courses in mathematics is about vectors and things you build out of vectors. So you express everything about geometry in terms of vectors or how they're changing or how you put two of them together and get planes and whatever. But what had been realized that Right on is that if you ask very very generally, what are the, if you have, what are the things that can, that you can kind of consistently think about rotating, and um, 
and you can, so you, you ask a technical question, what are the representations of the rotation group? Well, you, you find that they're, one answer is they're vectors and everything you build out of vectors. But then you, people found, but wait a minute, there's also these other things which you can't build out of vectors, but, but which you can consistently rotate and they're they're described by pairs of complex numbers by two complex numbers and they're 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 the spinners also and to make a long, and and to make and and you can think of spinners in some sense as more fundamental than vectors because you can build vectors out of spinners you can take two spinners and make a vector but you can't you can't if, if you only have vectors you can't get spinners so there in some sense at, there's some kind of level of lower level of geometry beyond what we thought it was which was kind of spinner geometry and this is something which, even to this day, when we teach graduate courses in geometry, we mostly don't talk about this because it's a bit it's a bit hard hard to hard to do correctly. If if, if you start if you start with your whole setup is in terms of vectors, getting describing things in terms of spinners is a whole different ball game. But um the but so but any, anyway, it was just this, this amazing fact that this this kind of more fundamental piece of geometry of spinners and what we were actually seeing, if you look at electron, are one and the same. So it's a, it's, I think it's kind of a, kind of a mind blowing thing, but it, it's very uh, un counterintuitive. What are some weird properties of spinners that, that are counterintuitive? That there are some things that they do, for instance, if you rotate a spinner around 360 degrees, it doesn't come back to where it's, it, it becomes minus what it was before. So it's, anyway, so, so the way rotations work, there's a kind of a funny sign you have to keep track of in some sense. Um, so they're kind of too valued in a, another weird way. But, there's a, but, but the fundamental problem is that it, it's just not, if you're used to visualizing vectors, you just, there's nothing you can do visualize in terms of vectors that will ever give you a spinner. It just is not gonna ever work. As you were saying that, I was visualizing a vector walking along a Mobius strip, yeah. and it ends up being upside down. Um, yeah. But you're saying that doesn't really capture. Yeah, right. So, I mean, what what really captures it? The pro the problem is that it, it's really the simplest way to describe it is in terms of two complex numbers. Mm -hmm. And our, your problem with two complex numbers is that's four real numbers. So, your spinner kind of lies in a four dimensional space. So you that makes it hard to visualize. And it's crucial that it's not just any four dimensions, it's just, that it's actually complex numbers. You're really gonna use the fact that these are the complex numbers. So it, it, um, <laughs> it's very hard to visualize. But, but to get back to what I think is mind blowing about twisters is that the, another way of saying this, this idea about talking about spheres, another way of saying the fundamental idea of twister theory is in some sense, the fundamental idea of twister theory is that a point is a two is a two is a two complex dimensional space, so that every and that it lives inside the, the space that it lies inside is twister space. So, in the simplest case, it's four twister space is four dimensional, and a point in space time is a two complex dimensional um, subspace of the of the of all the four complex dimensions. Mm -hmm. And as you move around in space time, you're just moving. Your planes are just moving around. Okay, and that, and but but then the so it's a, it's a plane in a four dimensional space. It's a it, yeah plane Com it, complex complex uh, plane. So it's two complex two dimensions complex. in four complex. Got it. But then, to me, the mind blowing thing about this is this then kind of tautologically answers the question: Is what is a spinner? Well, <laughs> a spinner is a point. <laughs> I mean, the space of spinners at a point is the point in twister theory. The points are the complex two planes, and and you want me to, and you're asking what a spinner is. Well, a spinner, in the space of spinners, is that two plane. So it, it's you know just your whole definition of what a point in space time was just told you what a spinner was. It's they're they're just it's the same thing. Yeah, but we're trying to project that into a three dimensional space and trying to intuit, but yeah, you yeah, can't. So, yeah, so the intuition becomes very difficult. But um, but from if you don't you not using twister theory. You have to kind of go through a certain fairly complicated rig rigmarole to even describe spinners, to describe electrons. Whereas using twister theory, it's just completely tautological. They're just what you want <laughs> to describe the electron is fundamentally the way that you're describing the point in space time already. It's just there.